subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IES Study Circle. Join the official Telegram channel of Rao's IES Study Circle to stay updated and get all the materials on the Telegram. The link to the channel can be found in the description box. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of newspaper reading from UPSC Civil Services Examination Perspective. Now today let us take up the important news which has appeared in the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 2nd July 2022. These are the list of the news which we will be taking up for today's discussion and their timestamp has been provided in the YouTube description. So on this note let's start our today's discussion from prelims and mains point of view. Now let's take up this article appearing on page number 6. Now this says recommended a dose of humor and democracy. Now though this article appears in a humorous form, it does address various issues at hand. However, from our examination perspective, particularly prelims, with respect to political system, it highlights about the key difference between a totalitarian government and an authoritarian government. Further, it also mentions about Mahatma Gandhi saying that he was a blissful anarchist. So on this note, let's go through some of the important terms which can be asked in the prelims examination as you can see. This particular prelims question was asked in the year 2020. So this question was, one common agreement between Gandhism and Marxism is, options were A. Goal of a stateless society B. Class struggle C. Abolition of private property and D. Economic determinism So in our discussion, let us understand these different terms which has been highlighted in this article so that if a question is asked in the prelims examination, you are able to attempt that. Now look at these two terms, totalitarianism and authoritarianism. Now both appears more or less same and both is a sort of complete or a blind submission to state and its authorities. But in totalitarianism, there is also a guiding ideology which the state highlights upon and expects the masses to follow. So the basic difference between totalitarianism and authoritarianism is in totalitarianism, apart from complete submission, there is also a guiding ideology. And in this reference, the article highlights about a book written by Arvind Narayan. The title of the book is India's Undeclared Emergency, Constitutionalism and the Politics of Resistance. So in this book, the author highlights about the concept of totalitarian rule. And in this, the author explains about a totalitarian government. So the extract from the book says that ambitions of a totalitarian government are far wider and its ability far deeper than those of an authoritarian one. Why this is so? Because of its ability to shape individual and society according to the ideology of the totalitarian government. So it says that a totalitarian rule goes beyond retaining control over the state to trying to politicize the masses and shaping individuals as per its ideology. And such totalitarian government draws strength and support not just from control over the levers of state but also from organizational fronts which work at the societal level, aiming to transform society in terms of its ideology. So when we talk about totalitarian government, apart from retaining control, it also aims to politicize the mass and also transform society in terms of ideology. But no such thing occurs under the authoritarian rule as it is mere submission to the power. And the authoritarian government lacks power to mobilize entire population because of a lack of an ideology. Now another difference between totalitarian and authoritarian government is that totalitarian states suppress traditional social organizations whereas authoritarian states will tolerate some social organization based on traditional or special interest. So authoritarian government will tolerate certain social organization but the same cannot be said about a totalitarian regime. It further says that unlike totalitarian states, authoritarian states lack the power to mobilize the entire population in pursuit of national goals. And it is mostly because of lack of an ideology with respect to authoritarian regime. Now regarding authoritarianism, the article gives an example of emergency declared by Indira Gandhi in 1975. So that can be said to be an authoritarian measures. So this is the difference with respect to totalitarian regime and authoritarian regime. Now you must understand this concept as a part of political system as question can be asked. Now look at this particular question again asked in the year 2020. The question was a constitutional government by definition is a options were a government by legislature b popular government c multi-party government and d limited government. Now constitutional government is a limited government because the constitution itself 
limits or in a way defines the roles of various organs of the constitution and important stakeholders or institutions thereby a constitutional government is a limited government now almost similar question was repeated in the prelims of 2021 the question was constitutional government means here options given were a a representative government of a nation with federal structure b a government whose head enjoys nominal powers c a government whose head enjoys real powers and d a government limited by the terms of the constitution so you can see almost similar nature of question asked by upsc with respect to a constitutional government here of course the correct answer was d that is government limited by the terms of the constitution and this is also what is the meaning of constitutionalism so constitutionalism refers to a limited constitution where powers of various organs of the government including important office holders and institutions are limited by the constitution itself so apart from highlighting about totalitarian and authoritarian regime the article further mentions about another term namely anarchism now the article says that anarchism and democracy are the antithesis and antidotes for totalitarianism so in this regard let us understand about anarchism so anarchism conceives states to be unnecessary and any form of government undesirable because it values the concept of liberty and also believes in rule by the people so an anarchic vision of society is non-violent self-managed and non-hierarchical and anarchist thinkers hold dear to the ideal of democracy which is ruled by the people now with respect to anarchist we can take the example of gram swaraj as proposed by mahatma gandhi where gandhi ji saw villages as smaller republics which was self sufficient in its needs which enjoys maximum freedom in deciding its own affairs and an institution which is organic and non hierarchical and accordingly gandhi ji wanted political power to be distributed among the villages in india and hence gandhi ji preferred the term swaraj what he described as true democracy and this article quotes a statement of mahatma gandhi where he says that state represents violence in a concentrated and organized form whereas individual has a soul but as the state is a soulless machine it can never be weaned from violence to which it owes its very existence said mahatma gandhi which the article claims that he was a blissful anarchist so anarchism on one hand not only prefers liberty and freedom to decide one owns affairs but also does not believe in any hierarchy or we can say it does not believe in any system of state or government however they believe in the ideals of equality and justice as these are to be sought through abolition of state and substitution of free agreements between individuals now this is because according to anarchist society is natural but societies are corrupted by artificial institutions created by state and one of the central idea to the principles of anarchism is the belief in individual freedom and also denial of any authority particularly that of the state which hinders human development and in this aspect the article says that democracy would be perfected by imbibing some idyllic dreams from anarchism now coming back to this particular question asked in 2020 here the correct answer was a that is the final goal of a stateless society and this was the common view point or agreement between gandhism and marxism so overall we can say that anarchism conceives states to be unnecessary and any form of government undesirable as it prefers rule by the people whereas marxism argues for workers revolution to overturn capitalism in favor of communism now communism refers to a political and economic doctrine which aims to replace private property and profit based economy with public ownership and community control of major means of production basically communism is against capitalism and another term which has been provided as an option in this question was economic determinism now economic determinism is a socio economic theory that economic relationships are the foundation upon which all other societal and political arrangements in a society are based so it's important to understand the meaning of these important terms which forms a part of political system now coming back to this particular question this was asked in the prelims of 2017 and this also becomes one of your practice question so your first practice question says local self government can be best explained as an exercise in options were a federalism b democratic decentralization c administrative delegation and d direct democracy 
So this article is a very interesting article as it provides a lot of humor but you must also understand some of the key terms which has been highlighted in this article particularly relating to political system based on which questions can be asked in your prelims examination. With this let's take up the next news for discussion. The next news to be taken up appears on page number 10. Now this news mentions that how delisting is a ticking political time bomb in northern Chhattisgarh. With the next assembly elections just about a year away, the drive towards delisting of converted rivals has attained great political significance in the state. Now this whole issue of delisting of tribals is regarding those tribals who have converted to either Christianity or Islam. Now in central India, mostly in Chhattisgarh, Odisha and also Madhya Pradesh, some of the tribals have converted to Christianity. And based on this, some of the social organizations are highlighting that those tribals who have converted to Christianity should not be given the benefits of reservation in jobs, education, local institutions, etc. and have also asked the union government to delist their community from the list of scheduled tribes under Article 342 of the Indian Constitution. And based on this, a rally was also organized in Narayanpur district of Bastar region in Chhattisgarh in April and it was organized by Janjati Suraksha Manch. And in this rally, thousands of tribals participated to bring awareness in the community and also send a message to the administration to check conversion activities taking place in the region. So we are witnessing a sort of a movement going on in central India, especially by the tribals against those tribals who have converted into Christianity or other religion, but still take or reap the benefits of reservation and other benefits available under the Indian laws. So the majority of the tribals feel that those converts have left their religion and also the cultural practices but still are enjoying the fruits of reservation for tribals. So that is why some of the social organizations have asked the union government to amend the constitution to change the presidential list which provides names of scheduled tribes. So as you can see that article 341 and 342 provides for such presidential list. 341 provides for a presidential list for the name of scheduled caste whereas article 342 provides for a presidential list for the scheduled tribes and article 342 clause 2 says that parliament may by law either include or exclude from the list of scheduled tribes specified under the presidential list any tribe or tribal community or part or group within any tribe or tribal community. So parliament can either add or remove name of any tribe or tribal community or group within the tribe from the presidential list under scheduled tribes. Now similar provision has been provided under article 341 clause 2 also. It says that parliament may by law include or exclude from the list of scheduled caste specified in the presidential notification any caste, race or tribe or part of group within any caste, race or tribe from the presidential list. So mainly this is the issue which has been highlighted in this article. Now apart from this, there are two other issues which have also been mentioned. These are the fact that if these tribals are delisted, then it might impact the electoral outcomes in the tribal populated areas and delisting of tribals may result in removal of the area from the list of scheduled areas under fifth schedule of the Indian constitution. So these are some of the concerns also which has been highlighted in this particular article. Now apart from this, Article 330 of the Indian Constitution also provides for reservation of seats for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe in Lok Sabha and Article 332 provides for reservation of seats for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe in legislative assembly based on the population of scheduled caste and scheduled tribe in their given constituency or state. Further, under Article 15.4 and 16.4, the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes also get benefits with respect to educational institutions and also public services. So it is because of these benefits availed under the Indian constitution, the tribal majority is saying that those tribals who have converted into Christianity or other religion, their names should be delisted from the presidential list under Article 342 of the Indian constitution. Now the Indian laws, including the constitution of India, provides adequate provisions for the protection of members of scheduled caste and scheduled tribe apart from the provisions of reservation and accordingly provisions have been provided under 5th and 6th schedule of the Indian constitution. Now under the 5th schedule, tribes advisory council has been constituted in 10 states having scheduled areas whereas under 6th schedule, regional council and district council has been constituted. 
Now under the fifth schedule, governor can modify any central law or state law to be applicable in the scheduled areas. Further provisions have also been provided under the Forest Rights Act, even under the new Land Acquisition Act as alienation of land from scheduled caste and scheduled tribe cannot happen unless it has been approved by either Gram Sabha or Autonomous Councils. And the Protection of Civil Rights Act also punishes untouchability and makes it a criminal offence. So let's go through some of the important highlights with respect to Panchayat's Extension to Schedule Areas Act, Forest Rights Act, Land Acquisition Act of 2013 and also powers of the Governor under 5th Schedule of the Indian Constitution. So under the PESA Act, following types of powers have been given to Gram Sabha. First is regarding developmental activities. So it says consultation before land acquisition is necessary. Gram Sabha's power to enforce prohibition. Prior approval of Gram Sabha is necessary in all developmental projects and control over tribal subclans. The Gram Sabha has also power to issue utilization certificate for developmental expenditures, selection of beneficiaries of poverty elevation and other schemes of individual benefits, and also control over institutions and functions of social sectors. Further, the Gram Sabha, under the PISA Act, is also empowered to resolve disputes as per traditional laws and customs. And it also provides for ownership and management of natural resources. Now, regarding the Forest Rights Acts, these are the certain rights which has been guaranteed. These include title rights, that is ownership to land that is being farmed by tribals or forest dwellers subject to a maximum of 4 hectares, rights to minor forest produce, relief and developmental rights with respect to rehabilitation in case of illegal eviction or forced displacement by authorities, forest management rights to protect forest and wildlife by ensuring sustainable use, conservation of biodiversity and maintenance of ecological balance, and livelihood and food security through the minor forest produce. So the minor forest produce is an important source of livelihood of tribals and forest dwellers and hence provide both subsistence and cash income for tribals. Now regarding alienation of land under Forest Rights Act, these are the authorities to whom powers have been vested. So the authorities in such case are Gram Sabha, Subdivisional Level Committee and District Level Committee. So if a tribal person is aggrieved by the decision of Gram Sabha, then he or she can approach the subdivisional level committee. If again they are aggrieved by the decision of subdivisional level committee, then they can approve the district level committee. Now even under the Land Acquisition Act of 2013, which is named as Right to Fair Compensation and Transparency in Land Acquisition, Rehabilitation and Resettlement Act 2013, Section 41 of this Act says, that Land Acquisition Act makes prior consent of Gram Sabha, Panchayat or Autonomous District Councils mandatory in all instances of land acquisition in scheduled areas under the 5th Schedule. Now further, under the 5th Schedule of the Indian Constitution, Governor is empowered specifically under Para 5 of 5th Schedule to establish an egalitarian society and for this purpose, Governor is empowered to restrict or modify any of the laws which can be applicable in the scheduled area in these 10 states. So it highlights that governor can specify any modification or exception regarding implementation of any law made by parliament or state legislature. It further says that any particular act of parliament or state legislature shall not apply to a scheduled area or any part of scheduled area in the state. And the governor is also empowered to issue notification in a retrospective manner, that is in the back date. So, these are some of the constitutional and legal provisions with respect to protection of scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, particularly in the scheduled areas. Now, based on our understanding so far, let's take up this particular question asked in the prelims of 2022 recently. The question here was, if a particular area is brought under the fifth schedule of the constitution of India, which one of the following statements best reflects the consequences of it? Options were A. This would prevent the transfer of land of tribal people to non-tribal people. B. This would create a local self-governing body in the area. C. This would convert that area into a union territory. And D. The state having such areas would be declared a special category state. Now in this the correct answer would be A. Which means if a particular area is brought under the fifth schedule of the constitution of India, then this would prevent the transfer of land of tribal people to non-tribal people. Now almost similar question was asked in the prelims of 2019. The question was, under which schedule of the Indian constitution can the transfer of tribal land to private parties for mining be declared as null and void? Almost similar questions asked in a different manner. 
in the year 2019 they were asking you about the schedules whereas in 2022 they mentioned about fifth schedule and then were asking about its important highlights so in 2019 also the correct answer was fifth schedule so almost similar questions have been asked by upsc in 2019 and 2022 regarding transfer of land of tribal people in the scheduled areas under fifth schedule of the indian constitution both from prelims and mains perspective and in the mains gets covered under gs paper 2 and also gs paper 1 particularly with respect to indian society regarding the movement of tribals who are protesting against such tribals who have converted to other religions now this news appears on page number 11 in the business section now this says government recast bank boards bureau to fsib now fsib stands for financial services institutions bureau now why this has been done this has been done because delhi high court last year stated that the bank boards bureau is not a competent body to select general managers and directors of state owned general insurers now a conflict or a stand off was also seen as in some of the appointments the government did not consult bank board bureau so from our prelims perspective we need to understand not only about banks board bureau but also its formation and its function so this bureau recommends name for selection of the heads of public sector banks and financial institutions and also helps bank in developing strategies and capital raising plans but the problem is that this bureau only recommends name for the selection of heads of these psbs and financial institutions however the final appointment is approved and done by the cabinet committee on appointments so its recommendations are not binding on the government now banks board bureau is also not a statutory organization as this bureau was not constituted under an act of parliament now look into this prelims question asked in the year 2019 the question was the chairman of public sector banks are selected by options given was a banks board bureau b rbi c union ministry of finance and d management of concerned bank now in this the correct answer of course was a that is banks board bureau so the constitution of banks board bureau was based on the recommendation of pj naik committee which recommended to constitute the banks board bureau way back in 2014 and based on this recommendation the government announced the formation or constitution of banks board bureau in the budget of 2015-16 and accordingly the banks board bureau was constituted on 1st april 2016 and later the scope of banks board bureau was expanded to recommend names of cmd and md of public sector insurance companies so overall some important highlights regarding banks board bureau it is not a statutory organization as it has not been set up through an act of parliament its mandate so far is to recommend names for selection of heads of public sector banks and financial institutions however its role is limited to recommending names as the final appointment is approved by the cabinet committee on appointments now seven members are part of banks board bureau however all the members including chairman are part time members only and regarding the functions of banks board bureau it recommends the selection and appointment of whole time directors and non executive chairman of nationalized banks public sector insurance companies and selected financial institutions such as exim bank sidbi national housing bank nabard iifcl and ifci another function of the bureau is that it develops appropriate methods to enable the search and selection of high caliber whole time directors of public sector banks it advises the central government on formulation and enforcement of code of conduct and ethics it builds data bank containing data relating to performance of public sector banks and share the same with central government and also helps the bank in terms of developing business strategies and capital raising plan now as you can see i have taken this picture from economic times and this highlights a stand off between the government and the banks board bureau as of 2017 so it says that the government swapped chiefs of idbi bank and indian bank without consulting the bureau further in may 2017 government shuts out chiefs of pnb and banks of india to two smaller psu banks without consulting the bureau or informing respective bank boards Another standoff point was that contrary to the board suggestion government appointed DB Mohapatra as chief of Bank of India and sent Sunil Mehta to head PNB 
So these standoffs reflects conflicts with the bureaucracy and also the fact that at times government bypasses the recommendation of the bank board bureau. And it is based on these confrontations. The Delhi High Court in its order last year suggested that the bureau is not a competent body to select the general managers and directors. And accordingly, the government of India has decided to transform the bank's board bureau into financial services institutions by making certain amendments. So, the Financial Services Institutions Bureau will make recommendations for appointments of full-time directors and also non-executive chairmen of banks and financial institutions and will also provide guidelines to select managers and directors of public sector general insurance companies. Now, to reconstitute the Banks Board Bureau into Financial Services Institution Bureau, the Appointments Committee of the Cabinet has asked the Department of Financial Services to bring necessary modifications in Nationalized Banks Management and Miscellaneous Provision Scheme after getting approval of the Ministry of Finance and then notifying the Government Resolution to establish the FSIB as a single entity. So in this regard, let's wait for the final notification of the government with respect to FSIB. And this topic becomes important mainly from the prelims perspective with respect to economic development as a question has already been asked by UPSC in 2019 with respect to Bank Sport Bureau. Now this news appears on page number 11 also and it says that the government hikes duty on gold to cushion rupee. Center raises tariff on gold to 15% imposes cess on export of crude oil fuels to check windfall profits. Now the government has increased duty on gold to reduce current account deficit as import of gold in the last month had increased to almost 9 times and because of surge in import of gold it was also putting inflationary pressure on the rupee. Thus to reduce current account deficit and also to ease inflationary pressure on rupee because more rupee was being spent on the import of gold. Hence, the government of India has increased custom duty on gold. So, to curb import of gold, customs duty has been increased from present 10.75% to 15%. So, the two main reasons to increase customs duty on gold is number one, to reduce current account deficit and also to ease inflationary pressure on rupee. Now, secondly, the government has imposed special addition excise duty on domestic crude oil. Now, let's understand this aspect. Now, the domestic crude oil producers within the country were selling to the domestic refinery, but at the cost which was prevailing in the international market. And since the cost in the international market as of now is very high, hence the domestic crude oil companies or producers were enjoying large amount of profit. Thus, to curtail the large amount of windfall gain by the domestic crude oil producers, the government has put additional excise duty. So, it says that domestic crude oil producers sell crude oil to the domestic refineries at the prevailing international crude oil prices. And since the international crude oil prices has risen sharply in recent months, the domestic crude oil producers have been making windfall gains. So, taking this into account, a cess of Rs 23,250 per ton in the form of special additional excise duty has been imposed on crude. However, imported crude oil would not be subject to this cess. Only the domestically produced crude oil would be subject to this additional cess. And thirdly, the government has levied special addition excise duty on export on petrol, diesel and aviation turbine fuel. Now this has been done to ensure that domestic supply of fuel is not disrupted. So again, the same reason applies here also. Now, because of increased price in the international market, a large number of refiners in India have been exporting more amount of petrol and diesel to take advantage of the prevailing higher prices. Obviously, since the price in the international market is high, hence more refined fuel is being exported outside India. And this in turn may lead to shortage of petrol and diesel in the domestic market. So to discourage exports and to ensure adequate supply of petrol and diesel in domestic market, CES equal to rupees 6 per litre on petrol and 13 per litre on diesel have been imposed on their exports. And on similar grounds, a special additional excise duty of Rs 6 per litre has been imposed on exports of ATF, that is aviation turbine fuel. Now apart from this, exporters would also be required to declare that at the time of exports, 
fifty percent of the outbound quantity of fuel has been or will be supplied in the domestic market to ensure adequate supply of petrol and diesel in domestic market during the current financial year. So this particular measure will ensure domestic availability of petroleum products, and it will also contain the price of petrol and diesel within the country. So these developments with respect to increase in customs duty on gold, imposition of special additional excise duty on domestic crude oil. and special additions excise duty on export on petrol diesel and atf are important from the prelims perspective especially regarding the economic development now the next news also appears on page number 11 in the business section the news highlights that pmi hints manufacturing slow to a 9 month low and prices drag confidence to 27 month low so according to the purchasing managers index inflationary pressures has dampened growth in india's manufacturing sector to the slowest pace in 9 months and pmi has reduced from 54.6 in may earlier to 53.9 in june so here let us first of all understand about the purchasing managers index and then we'll try to figure out the news highlighted here purchasing managers index is basically published by japanese firm nikki but it is compiled and constructed by market economics and for the us it is the institute of supply management now pmi is basically calculated on the basis of information received from companies and only private companies on various factors that represent demand conditions and based on this pmi is very different from iip that is index of industrial production for india which is an indicative of actual production so pmi takes in responses from company on a monthly basis and on whether there has been improvement deterioration or no change for a set of parameters relative to previous month so the score of 50 for pmi is the benchmark and any score more than 50 means expansion in the business and any score less than 50 means contraction in the economy and for the score pmi takes into account the following parameters for calculation which are new orders output employment suppliers delivery and stock of purchases and the questionnaire prepared is given to 500 private sector companies and comprehensive score is arrived at so pmi is constructed separately for manufacturing and services sector but the manufacturing score of pmi holds more importance and this is what the news also highlights that pmi hints manufacturing is slowing to a 9 month low for indian economy So regarding understanding the index value or the score of PMI scores above 50 denotes expansion in business activity as highlighted here and scores below 50 denotes contraction in the economy further higher the difference from this midpoint greater the expansion or contraction and this also signals the rate of expansion so suppose for example in a particular month the score was 55 and in the subsequent month the score dropped down to 52 so it means that earlier there was expansion in the economy but this expansion slowed down because of this score of 52 so it says that the rate of expansion or contraction can also be judged by comparing pmi data from previous months and if the figure is higher than the previous months then the economy is expanding so suppose in this case the pmi score for the next month is 57 so it means that the economy is expanding however if the score is 52 then it means that the economy is contracting so it says if it is a lower than the previous month then it is growing at a lower rate and this is what has been explained in this particular news if you go through it now regarding pmi let's also try and understand its importance and try to compare it with iip that is index of industrial production so pmi is usually released at the start of the month much before most of the official data on industrial output manufacturing and gdp growth becomes available and because of this reason it is considered as a good leading indicator of economic activity in a country now with respect to pmi and iip pmi is published by nikki whereas iip is published by national statistical office pmi does not track actual production whereas iip tracks actual production PMI covers only 500 private sector companies whereas IIP covers both private sector and public sector undertakings it covers manufacturing and services however IIP only covers manufacturing PMI is less comprehensive since it covers only private sector obviously IIP is more comprehensive that way as it covers also PSU and PMI is not used for calculation of GDP whereas IIP score is used for GDP calculation for the unorganized sector Now based on these understandings of PMI this news highlights that new export orders rose for third successive month in June and employment rose for fourth successive month 
However, the manufacturing sector displayed encouraging resilience on the face of acute price pressures, rising interest rate, rupee depreciation and challenging geopolitical landscape. It further says that there was broad-based slowdown in growth across number of measures such as factory orders, production, exports, input buying and employment as clients and business restricted spending amid increased inflation. So these are some of the highlights with respect to the score of PMI which reflects the status of Indian economy. So this topic again becomes important mainly from your prelims perspective with respect to economic development. With this let's take up the question for the day. Now based on our discussion this becomes your practice question for the day. The question is central government has taken which of the following steps and why? First increased custom duties on gold to reduce current account deficit and ease inflationary pressures on Indian rupee. Second. Central government has levied special edition excise duty on domestic and imported crude oil as domestic crude oil producers sell crude oil to the domestic refineries at lower price than prevalent in the international market rate. So the question is select the correct answer using the code given below. Options are A 1 only, B 2 only, C both 1 and 2 and D neither 1 nor 2. Now coming to the answer of yesterday, the question was consider the following statements with reference to Amir Khusro. First, he belongs to the reign of Muhammad bin Tughlaq, but he was patronized by Sikandar Lodi. No, this statement is incorrect. Second, he is regarded as father of Kawali and also developed many style of Hindustani music. Yes, this statement is correct. Hence, the correct answer here becomes B, that is two only. With this, we come to an end to today's discussion. Thank you for watching DNS.